Welcome everybody. I'm Amy Lintz and I'm the alumni director for University of Idaho. Um, and it's a really exciting time here on the Palouse where we are um, just now seeing enrollment numbers coming in and we're, we're, our enrollment is up for this fall. So that's always just a really nice tidbit of, of information for all of you. It means we're doing great work out there and the alumni have a lot to do with it. Um, we are uh, excited to bring to you a cup of joe. And today we have a conversation with Dr. Sydney Freeman. So, so Dr. Freeman, thank you for being here. Um, Dr. Freeman is a full professor with, within the leadership and counseling department at the University of Idaho. And under his leadership, um, as the founder and the director of the University of Idaho's Black History Research Lab, the lab has received uh, letters from the US Senate and the governor and the state of Idaho. He is a prolific author. I couldn't believe this when I saw this number. I had to make sure my eyes weren't going bad, but he has nearly 100 publications to his credit and he's lectured and presented at institutions such as Harvard University, Oxford University, Jerusalem College of Technology, um, and also the RMIT University in Vietnam, Saigon. And he is nationally and internationally um, recognized for his historic scholarship in the areas of black studies and religion. Um, he was honored as one of the accomplished under 40 award recipients um, in 2020 um, by the Idaho Business Review. That is fantastic, such a great event. Um, and last year he received um, the Estelle Perpetua Award from the Idaho State Historical Society for his scholarship related um, to preserving black history. So congratulations on, on both of those huge accomplishments. And in sep September, he received the 2023 American Association for State and Local Histories Excellence in Leadership History Award on behalf of the University of Idaho's Black History Research Lab. So he's also honored, I mean, the list can keep on going and going. He was also honored to be the recipient of the Moscow, Idaho uh, Sheet Community Unity Award for 2023, which included receiving a personal award from the mayor. His name engraved on the award plaque is in the city hall. Um, so that is just fun. I'm, I go in there free, in, infrequently, but I'll make sure to look for that, Dr. Freeman. And you recently has been selected as one of the distinguished recipients for the North Idaho Business Journal's 40 Under 40 Class of 2024. So um, quite, quite impressive. And I am so honored and so glad that you were able to join us today. I would like to um, start this off, Dr. Freeman. What is it that you... Um, what is it that you do at the university? Because it's a lot, but how do you sum it all up and how can you um, distill that so our alumni can get a better sense of what you what you do here at University of Idaho? Well, first of all, I wanna say thank you so much for this opportunity to speak to this important audience. Um, I am a full professor in the College of Education and Health and Human Sciences here at the University of Idaho. I've been here for eight and a half years, but um, you shared a lot related to my, my bio and simply what I, I do on a regular basis is I teach in the area of leadership. But what's really more important, uh, I think, to share with you is that uh, I've been married for nearly 15 years. On March 15th, I will have been married to my college sweetheart for for those 15 for those 15 years uh, she's actually a faculty member uh, a clinical asso associate professor in the whammy program the medical education program here at the university of idaho and i believe it was, it was in 2022 when she became uh one of the uh idaho women of the year uh sponsored by the idaho business review so while uh, while I have some accolades, I am supported by someone that's amazing, and just wanted to also add that piece to uh, what you know about me. Well, thank you. That's an important part of your life, and we're glad that 
we're, we're glad that you shared that. So, um, so earlier in your career, you worked in universities in Alabama and you received your master's and your PhD degrees from Auburn. So what, what brought you to the University of Idaho? Yes, so it's just so happened that I was looking for opportunity to become a tenure track faculty member. And at the time, uh, the chair of the leadership and counseling department uh, was located at the Boise Water Center. And he posted on Facebook, there's this unique faculty position that was being offered uh, at the university and just put it out there to see if anyone would be interested in that position. Particularly, it was positioned to develop our PhD in higher education leadership program. And so I reached out to him. He said, uh, throw your name in the hat. I threw my name in the hat, came to campus. Uh, the faculty, the faculty and administration rolled out the red carpet for me. Uh, and so uh, it was it was amazing. They uh, actually uh, made sure that my wife was also able to uh, have a faculty position. And so it was a no brainer to to come here. Uh, although we don't have our PhD in higher education leadership, uh, it's been fun to be a part of uh, a part of a team of colleagues to build our adult organizational learning and leadership program over these last eight and a half years. Wow, that that's great. Well, we're lucky to have you, and we're glad that 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 you're here with us now. Um, well, I guess you know, University of Idaho. We we speak passionately about the place that we work. So what is your favorite thing about working at the University of Idaho and what keeps you here? And hopefully, hopefully you'll stay with us for a long time. <laughs> well, I think what's really important is our uh, most important is our students. I just had a, uh, a wonderful opportunity to interact with our undergrad students last week. Uh, why I say that I have to preface it that way is because I mostly teach at the graduate level, the master's or the PhD level. And so because of that, I don't have as many opportunities uh, every week to interact with our undergrad students, but I had the opportunity to engage with them, the, these smart and bright minds about issues related to higher education and uh, student activism and all that, all that great stuff uh, to make the institution better. And so I would say it's the opportunity to help to shape minds, our PhD, our PhD students that are going to go out and change the world with research and, and in areas of higher education leadership in particular. I really enjoy the opportunity to work with them on a, a daily basis. Beyond that, I have been able to start something called the Black History Research Lab, which has focused in on uh, celebrating uh, celebrating the contributions of African Americans to the university and beyond, and that has been a wonderful, wonderful project to work on. We've partnered with our friends at the library, our friends in the history department, uh, and others uh, to make make it happen. We have an interactive website that I'm sure that. Uh, we'll we'll share the link with you, but th those are some of the things that are really important. Oh, my shirt! The this is a new initiative, the Black Research uh, Institute for Flourishing and Thriving. So on one end you have the historical part, and then now we're looking at what's going on presently and into the future to ensure that Black people have a sense of belonging here at the institution and can flourish and thrive as professionals. Dr. Freeman, can, can you take a moment and dive a little bit deeper in what is the Black History Research Lab? What are the goals? What are you setting out to do? Who works there? I yeah. think are, are very interested in, in that. Yeah, so the Black History Research Lab was started out of conversation during and after the Black Lives Matter uh, movement time period, I would say in 2022, when uh, institutions were uh, being, being intentional about 
showing that we are supportive of the needs of black students, faculty and staff in particular. And so in, in conversation with leadership, I was saying that what was really important was for us to really trumpet uh, the things and the contributions that blacks have made to the institution and beyond. And so was able to secure a grant to start the lab and through the lab, we've been able to hire students for the last three years. Um, and so we have, we have both graduate and undergraduate students. Uh, we've been able to hire some temporary, temporary workers to assist us with the work. Uh, when I said that we partner with the, uh, with the library uh, and the history department, because I'm actually, my, uh, my tenure, my tenure home is the College of Education. I wanted to, you guys probably can't see this clearly, but I have to represent my college. This is the College of Education. So those in the audience from, from the College of Education, you can go back and tell my dean that I represented as well, okay? Uh, but um, but through, through the lab, we've been able to create an interactive website that chronicles, that, that chronicles all of the history between 1899 up to now. Uh, we have now over a thousand uh, artifacts that you can go on our website and actually view. We have at least 15 uh, videos that you can view uh, that tells a story about important moments uh, uh, important moments at the university as it relates to the Black community. We highlight, uh, one of the things I'm really excited about is we highlight the stories of alums and we uh, highlight the experiences of our Black faculty and staff and of course interviews with students. So it's a very interactive website. We have, beyond that, we have a traveling exhibit that has gone all over the state uh, it's been a part of theaters. It's been hosted at theaters, uh, museums, and other events across the state. Just telling telling our story, as our president likes to say, and I always like to say in my presentations, is that you can't tell the University of Idaho story, the true story, the full story, without uh, sharing the story of how African Americans and Blacks have contributed to the university. And lastly, uh, I will say this, one of the things that we're most excited about now is that we have, in addition to having the book, we've created a companion course, an open access online course where you can enter, it's, it, when I mean interactive, I'm meaning that you can, it's not necessarily games, but you can actually click on things and I uh, have videos and other kinds of things that takes you through from 1899 up to now, some of those points related to the contributions of Blacks at the university. So our, my, the thing that I tell my, my staff is that if you have people that want a physical book, we got a physical book. If you have people that like to be online, you have the online version. If you want to learn about it through a traveling museum and kind of see and touch, you have it that way. And then if you want to take a course, you can do it that way. So the idea is to, is to make this public and, and accessible to, uh, to the public. So uh, I know that's a long answer to a, a very short question, but wanted to share, share uh, some of the things that, that's been going on. That is awesome. If, if somebody would like or has an idea of where that exhibit should be? I mean, is there, a, how do how do we um, give you a suggestion or share some ideas on where we should maybe see that exhibit in other places? Yes, yeah, so right now it's actually, uh, some of our exhibit is located on the first floor in the ISUB or what we call the TLC, the Teaching and Learning Center. Uh, and if you go to, the first first floor, there is a kind of a display area on that first floor where if you're going to, there's a little side room. We have videos, videos that are 
uh, that are being shown all the time with uh, telling the story of the contributions of Blacks at the University of Idaho. Well, we have a few of the uh, displays up, but we actually, we have more than um, 15 large uh, display banners that uh, that we take around take around the state and uh, uh, feel free to reach out to me and I'm sure they'll put my my university contact information in the in the chat at some point uh, so you can uh, reach out to me if you would like to have it uh, close to you guys. So uh, one one question that came in is. What was one of the stories that surprised you as you've done this research? Was there a particular story that stood out that really that that took you back that really surprised you that you might want to share with with folks? Yeah, so thank you thank you for that question. I, I would say um I would say the biggest thing was just learning about the black an African American cultural center that we actually had one in 1971, right? It actually was located in the same vicinity as where we have the University of Idaho bookstore. That's where it first started. And then it was called the Master's House at that time. Then in there was um then that building was closed down. And then they moved to another building. I'm forgetting the name of the fraternity uh, house that uh, is now located where they were moved to, but essentially it was moved in 1973 to that particular building. The next year, the uh, pipes burst in the building, right? And so they condemned that, they condemned that particular building, and therefore, uh, we did not have the Black Cultural Center. And one of the things that, uh, the arguments that I made to administration was that the reason that we were not able to keep that continuously was because it was based on students. It was based on student leadership, but there were no uh, staff assigned to, uh, it was not assigned to that particular initiative. So when the opportunity came to talk about what things could we do to show that black lives within the campus mattered, right? It was important for us to have um, a person that served in the role of supporting our students. And I'm so glad uh, that now, because we could make the argument that this is why history is so important. We didn't say that uh, we're trying to create a black cultural center. This is in our history, right? And so we were able to make that connection and make the argument. So that's why I'm so glad we, we have uh, a center director under the name of uh, Mario Pyle. And we have, uh, have support for his office through the person uh, Bex Reen. And so they're moving and making things happen to support our students. And I, I hope and encourage our alumni who are here that you find ways to support this very important work. Thank you. That's great. So um, what are some of the favorite moments that you've had working with students? You've mentioned students a couple times. So that's terrific. It's, it, it, it's great that you partner so strongly with them. What are some of your favorite moments working with them? So I, I would say some of the best moments has been the opportunity to have us have bring in some of the best African-American or black thinkers on campus um, over the last, particularly the last three years. Uh, we have something called the Black Lives Matter series, series now that we call the Black Excellence uh, series, speaker series, where we have different individuals who are talking about ways that we can empower uh, African-Americans, uh, faculty, staff, students, all of us, and we also talk about ways in which uh, the broader campus can provide support to this most important group of a group of individuals. And so, working with the students in the lab has been uh, has been important. Um, working with students now on this new initiative, the Black Research Institute 
for flourishing and thriving, really thinking about ways in which I can connect the students on campus to the community. What we've been able to do is uh, I work with one of my students, his name is Ajiman, uh, and he's from Ghana. And one of the things that we were able to do in our first event that we partnered with the uh, Chamber, the Moscow Chamber of Commerce and Visitors Center to talk about ways, the ways in which the community, the, particularly the business community and other citizens to better support Blacks, blacks uh, within the city. My student, Ajiman, came up with 10 best practices to share with those individuals. Uh, and that was a great opportunity. We've had opportunities for students to help facilitate uh, the traveling exhibit. We've had uh, opportunities for, uh, for students uh, within their research to research um, uh, different stories around, around Blacks at the university. And I'm so proud. One of the things that you would be proud of our recent alumni and students has been that most of the heavy labor, most of the, the, the work has been done by students. I know because I am the, the director that a lot of the attention comes to me. But to be honest with you, if you look at the book, the first author of the book was a recent graduate of the institution. Uh, the course that was put together, I hired a uh, former student uh, at the university who actually is from England. Uh, had them had them lead in constructing these things. So it was really important for the students to take the lead on many of this of these projects and I'm so proud of them. Yeah, lots to be lots to be proud of. Um, can you share some insight of the African American and black populations that are currently at the University of Idaho with all of us? Yes, so I would say that uh, we are around 1%, 1 or 2% of the, uh, if we're talking about the student body. Uh, one of the things that is interesting, both uh, as we relate, uh, as it relates to faculty, the Black faculty composition and the student composition, over time, it has shifted uh, the, eth the ethnicity. Uh, and when I'm talking about ethnicity, I'm talking about the place of origin where the individuals come from. So for instance, if you would have talked about the 60s, right, they would have been what we call Black Americans, right? So people who are descendants of slaves uh, from this country. Uh, now we have mostly both as it relates to faculty and as it relates to, to students, uh, besides those who are, are athletes, there are much less of a percentage of African Americans or Black American students, but more students that are coming from uh, immigrant populations or those who are first generation. Um, and I think, I think there's a whole discussion that can be had about the importance of making sure that we are, that we are providing opportunities to all Black students, um, as that's been our history. So what are the graduate students and age demographics? Do you kind of have an idea of that and with within a our population of I I don't. I don't. Yeah. I would have to, I would have to go to I would have to go to institutional research to get get down to the those numbers. Yeah, no worries. Definitely. It just was a question that was coming in with with specifics to that. Um, switching gears a little bit, in November, and I've watched some of these, and they're really exciting, so we're hoping to make maybe get you get everybody some more information on this. Um, you were a featured speaker at University of Idaho's first ever POP Talks, and POP stands for Power of Possibility, and it's very similar to the, to the TED Talks, and you gave us a look ahead at the year of 2035, when Black students and faculty members, staff, administration are thriving at every level at the university and feel a strong sense of belonging. Can you talk a little bit about that pop talk and what you talked about and um, is it, it, and provide us a little bit, little bit more insight on that pop talk so others can maybe watch that? So essentially the pop talk was 
was an uh, was an opportunity to share about where the status of Black people could be in the future. So I think I said the year twenty forty five or something something to that uh, that effect, where I said that uh, we would have a population of at least five hundred. Uh, black students on campus and 18 at the time would be 18,000 uh, students at the university o overall, we would have a black provost, we would have a black person who was running the uh, Coeur d'Alene uh, Coeur d'Alene Center, right? And we, and we, we painted a picture of the institution where black Black students, faculty, and staff felt embraced and were positioned to lead at the university along with others, right? Uh, and I think it's important, I thought it was important to take the opportunity to provide a glimpse into what the future could be. Because a lot of times when we talk about the future, uh, of institutions, we often think of one particular de demographic, and I wanted to paint a picture that was inclusive and in which in which people could see themselves as a part of that that future. And what was so nice was some of the students who came up to me were not just African Americans, but they were those who are Latinx or from the Hispanic community and from the Native American community, Indigenous community, that began to say, "Wow." I want to learn more about your research because um, those are some of the ideas and things I'm thinking about as it relates to my community at this at this university. So, Dr. Freeman, where where do you think we are on this journey right now in, in present day to kind of achieve that vision in 2045? This is this is a real tough question that you're uh, that you're asking, and I'm going to be honest about it. So. I would say that the institution has made strides over my time being here. I remember when I first got here, there were, at the time, I believe like five African Americans that were brought in my, brought in my first year. And I remember uh, the Black Student Union, which is our Black student organization, our primary Black student organization on campus, their leadership called us in the room in the, uh, in the ISUB building. And that's the student, the student uh, union building, and they said we need we need help with this 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 and this, and so uh, that it was a great time to to really talk about some of the things that ways in which we could support students. And this is one of the things that I mentioned in in my speech is that a lot of times leaders think that what we're going to do is just invest in this. We're going to quote unquote invest in the students, right? But what I have found and what the literature shows, and if you just stop most Black students, if you said, give me five things that the university could do to better support you, they would say, and included in that would be, we need to have more Black administrators in senior level positions. When I say that, I'm talking about the president's cabinet. I'm talking about the provost council, these kinds of top leadership. And we need to have more uh, black faculty. Uh, I believe we've made strides by having the black uh, black and African American Cultural Center and having leadership there and providing uh, support for our students in many different different ways and programming. Uh, but I have to be honest: if we're talking about you know House Bill thirteen fifty seven. Uh, one that's trying to undermine much of the work that we've been doing regarding supporting our black our black students uh, our our black students by taking away diversity program taking away this saying that we're going to take away the leadership of of uh, the women's center it's taking away the leadership of the LGBTQ center saying that for the same for um, uh, the Black Cultural Center, those are things that are detrimental to, to the work that we're, the strides that we made. And if we wanna, you talked about, Amy, about the enrollment, excitement around the enrollment, 
one of the big selling points is that we have a space, a sacred space for our, our Black students in particular. Um, and so a lot of the pressure is e external. Some of the challenges are, are external, not necessarily internal. All, all, um, all of our uh, predominantly white institutions uh, have challenges with uh, providing adequate support for Black populations. So that's not a that's not something that just Idaho has to deal with. But we also are dealing with some of the other political things that are going on. So I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge uh, that as something that challenges uh, our students, our Black students, faculty, staff, and administrators. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, so you you mentioned that that as a university community, community, we can incorporate different strategies um, that really center on the Black sense of joy and belonging. You've talked a little bit about that. Can you give us a little bit more depth here on what those strategies are? And, you know, there's a lot of people that just want to want to take action and, and help and, and, and be welcoming and, and, and anything more you can share on that. Yeah, so number one, we need to have more, We right now we have no, that I know of no senior level black administrators. So that's a great place to start. Second place, second place is more black faculty um, because students wanna see people that reflect who they are, right? Uh, they wanna have role models. And so those, those are great places to start. Uh, I think one of the things that I would love to see is that the Black and African American Cultural Center is endowed, right? And so it's not based on student student funding. Uh, it's not based on the political winds of what's going on external to us. There are resources that have endowed that particular center to ensure that our Black students are supported. I would love, of course, for my Black History Research Lab to be supported uh, and funding. I think they're going to provide a link later on uh, with information to do that. Uh, but I think those are kind of of the first the first things. I think I think in addition to that, uh, when we're talking about alumni, when I when when I'm saying ways that you can support uh, this work. I think when I'm talking about endowments, that's one that's one place. But you can go online to with, with you Idaho gives, and you can give to uh, the Black and African American Cultural Center. You can give to the Black History Research Lab. So remember that. Well, I will share this that the initial funding that came to the lab that came to the Research Institute uh, started from little small, I shouldn't say little small, but they came from what we call seed grants from the university, yeah. right? But ultimately, uh, people are encouraged to go and, and to get grants, right? But people are not going to give you grants to study yourself. Alumni has, if I'm going to study alumni, I need alumni to step up and help fund the work to make that happen, right? And so I think for, if you're talking about what can the, what can alumni do long-term, I think is to step up in the way of, of resources and to ensure that these important initiatives are funded and so that they can perpetuate down the line. Thank you, Dr. Freeman. A uh, quick question that came in. How what are some of the things that you do to help recruit more African Americans to our institution? And what are some of the challenges and what are some of those things that you feel like really work to help help get more students here to the University of Idaho? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. So my job, even though some would say uh, a part of all of our job is to recruit, uh, to recruit, but I don't take that on as my job. I have enough that I'm doing with teaching, research, service, outreach. Um, and so what I do is speak well of the institution. I'm, I'm often on, on TV and other platforms. And so I've been on local NPR and all these kinds of things. 
And so what I try to do is um, share the ways in which the university is moving forward uh, and supporting black, uh, black students. Uh, how, however, um, that is not my area of, of specialty as far as actually going out and, and doing the recruiting. Uh, we have a great recruiting staff uh, at the university that focuses in on those particular, uh, particular areas. Thank you for that clarification. Um, so thinking back on your entire career in academics and research, what are some of your favorite projects that you've led? Um, and is there anything you have not done that you want to lead? Yeah, so when I first got here, I had something, I, I was blessed with the opportunity to start something called the Journal for the, for the Study of Post-Secondary and Tertiary Education. It was an international uh, academic journal that supported scholars that wanted to write, uh, write about issues related to higher education. All right. So challenges, whether it's related to faculty and staff and students, um, it was an academic journal that provided uh, scholars around the world the opportunity to uh, publish their work. And I'm most proud of the work that we did uh, did there. Um, not only did we have an opportunity to provide um, pro provide these opportunities to uh, our students to to serve as editors in different ways. Um, some of our staff members were able to contribute to it. And we also had uh, other faculty on campus that published in that particular journal, uh, which was uh, really something that I really enjoyed. Of course, uh, the Black History Research Lab is something that I would, would say will hopefully go down as a part of the legacy that I've been a part of. And right now, I'm really excited about the Black Research Institute for Flourishing and Thriving. Uh, I believe that we have to do two things at the same time. We have to say, here's the historical piece, right? We have to, one of the things that I'm most proud of uh, in partnership with something, somebody by the name of Devin Becker, he's the Associate Dean for Research uh, in the Library. What we've been able to do is create a mechanism when there is, when students take pictures or, or there are videos with students on it or TikTok or other platforms or there's a, a big event, what we're able to do is to provide a link for them to upload that information. And then at some point it's uploaded to the actual website so that people can uh, see it. And so I often talk to my staff uh, my student staff about what are the things that you want to be archived that you can see in the year if if uh, they're able to live to the year 3000, right? They're able to go back and see what they contributed to the, uni to the university in the year 3000. So I'm really proud about creating these kinds of mechanisms where we're, th we're doing things uh now that prepares us for the future right uh I, and i'm particularly telling them is that even though you have these four years in in your undergrad uh these are going to be formative years and important years that you're going to want to look back to and so uh you may want to uh, make sure that that's chronicled great thank you and speaking of uh the student component um the alumni organization, our, our alumni organization, recently refreshed and relaunched a Vandal Mentor Network, where we're matching um, alumni to students. And in particular, College of Education is very interested in those member uh, those mentorships with students. Do you see some good opportunities there where our alumni can can help the students? And are the students accepting of having a mentor? Some some bristle and think it's too formal sometimes, and um, but others seem to be really embracing it. So, any thoughts on those partnerships? Yeah, I think that's a, I think that's really important, and I think I mean we all have different personalities and things like that, and sometimes things are not always the the great greatest match. 
but I think you will find that students writ large uh, are going to be, uh, especially if they're seniors and juniors and seniors, they want to, to have these experiences with those who have been out there in the field and have some experience and they can share their insights that will help them uh, in the future. One of the things I want to tag on to that is um, when you asked me, Amy, the question about uh, tell me a story that you that you uh, discovered in your research. One of the hardest things has been that we do not have a robust uh, collection of stories from alums. So our next for the next uh, year and a half, the project that we're working on, and I'm hoping that we can actually partner with your office is to actually collect uh, collect uh, interviews from black alumni so that we have that information. So what we most of our the information that you will find in the book about the contributions of blacks at the University of Idaho, most of them are based on facts that we get from the Argonaut and from other accounts. But what would be great is to get the wealth of experiences and knowledge on paper. And one of the things that you will see on the website about the contributions of blacks to the University of Idaho is that we have an interactive, uh, an interactive, uh, what would you call it, um, graphic that um, we have interviews with different Black faculty and administrators over the years uh, that, that our students interviewed those individuals. And then let's say they were talking about enrollment, right? You can click on the term enrollment and in all of those interviews, they show you where the faculty talked about or the administrators talked about enrollment, right? Uh, all at the same time. So you can just look at what did black what black faculty say about enrollment? What did black faculty say uh, about teaching? Whatever the issue. And we want to do the same thing for alums so we can learn. And I think it becomes a treasure trove for students to do thesis and uh, dissertations on. So these are things I think would be a, a, a big contribution to the university at large into the future. And hopefully we can partner with the alumni office on that project. I love it. I, I definitely love that idea of the partnership. Um, in fact, I wanted to do a little bit of a plug. Both Sandy Larson, who is kind of helping us uh, today on this program, as well as Kate Colvin, who is on the line, they oversee our chapters and they also oversee what we call affinity chapters. So we're really working hard to, um, to uh, launch and we have launched our veterans affinity program as well as our Latin X. And we, we've had an African-American uh, alumni uh, organization and we want to make sure it's on strong, strong foundation and we, you know, get that off the ground and partner wherever we can. And those sometimes bring out the best stories as well, because we're reconnecting with alumni that that um, we definitely want to reconnect with. So stay tuned for more on that one. We'll definitely uh, want to talk to you more about that, Dr. Freeman. So awesome. Um, I also had a question from, I think, staff or faculty members, since you mentioned that, what are some other things that staff and faculty can help do to help with the retention of the Black uh, and African-American students? That is, that is interesting. I think one of the ways is to support uh, the Black and African-American Cultural Center. So I would I encourage them to, to go over to the Black and African-American Cultural Center, generally the the director is there. The Black and African American Cultural Center is in the ISUB. It's on the, I believe it would be the third floor, the third floor uh, near the Career Services Center. And um, I would just say, or set, send them an email, set up a conversation. Um, one of the things that uh, that we know is that that cultural centers are are notoriously underfunded and understaffed, right? 
And so the best way in which you can help is to reach out and ask how you can help, right? Um, there, that is, I would say the first, the first way, uh, because I don't want to speak for, want to speak for, for them. And I always am, uh, while I do the history, I, I, I say I do the research part. That's my strength, right? I'm, I'm the researcher. The whole I hope that the work that I research informs their practice, but they're the individuals on the ground every day speaking to students, supporting students. And I think it's really important to ensure that we uh, hold up the hands metaphorically of those that are on the ground doing that work. All right, thank you. I will make sure that we pass that along to other people that might ask that same question. So, um, so you have a very strong social media presence. I see you out and about on, on X, which is formerly Twitter, and um, you probably are on other platforms as well. Uh, so on a platform where you can share just about anything, um, how are you using social media? Um, and, and how can we follow you, I guess, as well? Yeah, so I think the main thing that I do is I like to talk about higher education issues writ large because that's, I have both my master's and PhD is in higher education leadership. And I, I say that because there's, so people are surprised that you can actually get a degree that prepares you for leadership, right? In higher education, not just kind of, there are those who go through they happen to be a chemist and they be they they show leadership and they become a chair the, and a dean and things like that but in my case i actually studied leadership for service in higher education so when i wake up in the morning i'm thinking about higher higher education issues whether it's finance or the presidency or whatever the case whatever the case may be so on online you will see me actively talking about some of the trends and some of the issues that are impacting higher education. Of course, I talk about the contributions of African-Americans often. And I like to talk about the things that are going on at the University of Idaho, uh, particularly around uh, the Black, uh, Black and African-American Cultural Center, the Black History Research Lab, and the Black Research Institute for Flourishing and Thriving. So you'll, uh, if you would go on, linked, uh, on LinkedIn, you'll see that uh, I'm often engaged in sharing a lot of information there. Uh, yes, uh, X, uh, formerly known as Twitter, uh, and Instagram is the other is the other um, platform in which I engage in. So uh, you have you can follow you can follow me at Doctor S F J. I think that is my. Um, I think that's the one for X. And then the one for Instagram is Dr. Sidney Freeman Jr. I make it as simple as possible. Dr. Sidney Freeman Jr. is the one for, for Instagram. That's great. We'll, we'll definitely try to get that in our chat as well. So people have, have those handles and can um, connect with you there as well. So, um, we are also noticing that you are, you know, you said a hundred publications and that's amazing. Um, do you have some other books in the works now or other publications that you're, you're, you're working on that we can stay tuned on that you might be publishing? Yeah. So one of the, one of the projects that I, I plan to work on uh, over the next year is I came up with a theoretical model related to our conceptual model right now. Uh, related to uh, black black um, liberation, what I'm calling black liberation, and so and transfer black liberation and transformation, and so I, I'm going to be spending maybe the next year and a half just really digging into what that looks like to empower uh, the black community within the context of the United States, where so much is going on. Uh, right now, politically and, and, and socially. And a uh, question for you, since you uh, seem like you're also a very prolific reader, what is 
one of your favorite books that you just would like to read over and over and over again? Hmm. That's a, that's a, a, a good question. I have this new book as um, that I'm enjoying. It's called Higher Education Leadership, Challenging Tradition and Forging New Possibilities. I had the opportunity, this is out of, out of John Hopkins Press. I had the, the pleasure of reviewing the book before it came out. I can show it to you. It's really a colorful, colorful book for those who are thinking about some of the challenges that we, that we face in higher education. I think this is a, a great primer or a primer and a starting place to think about those things. So this book has been one that was important. Um, and the authors are Rosanna Cardosi, Jordan Harper, and Adriana Kizar. Sorry about that. I went on, had my mute button on. That that's great. Thank you, Dr. Freeman. That's always of interest to people. Is what are people reading these days? So that sounds like a great a great tip. Um, we only have a few moments left, and then I needed to spend a minute to or to closing this out. So what is next in store for you? You've already talked about the one of the publications that you're working on. So. You are a very, very busy man. So I can imagine you have like 10 balls in the air right now, but what, what's next? What can we hear more about from you? The main thing is to work with my, work with my college and the university uh, to endow the Black, uh, Black History Research Lab and the Black Research Institute for Flourishing and Thriving. Uh, as I said earlier in the program, while grants are great, um, grants come and go. Right. And and so what happens is those things don't get institutionalized, things that we that we think are valuable for our students to have access to. And so I believe the way in which to do that is to is to encourage alums to into to invest uh, in these types of initiatives and not in kind of. Um, in ways uh, invest in it in ways that will ensure that it will last it will last beyond one person, one personality, right? I, what we want is, is that uh, everything doesn't rest on Dr. Sidney Freeman Jr.'s shoulders, but we want it to, we want to be positioned uh, to uh, have these initiatives last um, for as long as we have Black students at the University uh, of Idaho. Uh, and next, as I, I shared with you, um, we want to really collect the experiences and stories of Black alumni and uh, looking forward to, to working with those on the line. There may be those who are not African-American, but no African-Americans or may have some stories uh, that they can recollect that will center the lives of African-Americans that we want to include in the archive that we have. Uh, so in the next year and a half we'll be doing that and a sub a sub part of of that is um uh focusing in on the lionel hampton lionel hampton school of music and the history of the lionel hampton school of music and the uh the, ja the jazz festival uh, although there's a popular narrative that is that's already in place uh, i've been talking to dr skinner uh, uh, and uh, he's looking forward to connecting me to his dad so we can dig a little deeper and uh, refresh that um, that narrative and how it may have impacted those who are African-American and things like that. So those are things that we're thinking about. I, I want to thank I, I want to thank uh, the alumni office for this opportunity to to share on this platform. I hope that um that the alumni leave encouraged and inspired to uh, find ways in which they can support the Black community, whether it's the Black and African American Cultural Center, or it's the Black uh, Research Institute for Flourishing and Thriving, or the Black History Research Lab. Um, all of these entities are important to the lifeblood of a vibrant Black community on campus, and uh, not only uh, should we do it? They, our students deserve 
uh, to have such entities on campus. So thank you again, Amy and Sandy for this uh, platform to share and uh, looking forward to partnering with you into the future. Thank you so much. There's several links. There's a link to a video that we couldn't show and you really want to, we'll, we'll send out a, another note summarizing everything, but the link to the video is fabulous. Um, please get on the social media as Dr. Freeman has um, provided a couple of his handles. I followed it. It's amazing to see all the, the great history, the stories, the work that's being done. Dr. Freeman, you're really an inspiration to so many people. I don't know if you know that completely, but I hear that so often. I know you've spoke throughout the state and people are so grateful for all the work that you're doing. And um, it, it's just so nice to have somebody that cares so much about our institution, but also the African-American populations. Your, your work is gonna live on into to a long, long time. And we really appreciate Dr. Freeman. Thank you, Sandy. And with that, go Vandals. Thank you.